And we, just to let you know about the recording, so we share the recordings uh, with you, um, those who, uh, who uh, attend, and, um, and then we use them for our own internal use. Sometimes we will share them with uh, participants in advanced programs, just to let you know how we use the, the recordings. Okay, so, so about 40 years ago, a book came out called The Inner Game of Tennis and, um, by uh, uh, Tim Galloway. And some of you may have read it. Um, I probably read it a long time ago, um, but it basically, it doesn't talk about like, you know, how to do a backhand or how to you know, do a serve, or of course, I don't know any, any of the lingo of tennis. Um, it's all about the kind of the inner space or the kind of the inner meaning making, just to introduce a term that we're going to use a lot today, uh, around how we show, how people show up in the game of tennis. And, um, and I've been for a long time really interested in the question around how do we show up? And so from the early days in Agile, uh, about 20 years ago, I, um, my principal focus has been on uh, like mindset and culture and meaning making and, you know, and, and increasingly using the term inner agility uh, as, as, a, as a kind of um, what needs to happen in order for agility to happen. And so that's been the sort of thing I've been involved in and I've been designing and creating leadership programs uh, along those lines. And that work um, eventually ended up being uh, a book, uh, going into my book called Evolve Agility, Growing an Agile Leadership Culture from the Inside Out. And um, <clears throat> so the book came out oh, uh, early 2019 and it's already, um, I already wish I could rewrite it. And so, so we've been doing a lot of work over the, the years since the book came out, developing the ideas, um, getting deeper into um, certain aspects of the book. Like for, for me, it's really been the focus is on how to facilitate transformative learning environments. And that's been a, a big area of research, both in the programs I lead and in the research that I actually do. And all of this has culminated into our creating the Center for Inner Agility. And, the, and uh, we'll say more about the, the center a little bit later, but basically the Center for Inner Agility is um, a, a place or an environment for us to develop this work and to share this work uh, uh, with people in the world and to help people be able to carry this work and bring this work into uh, the coaching work and the consulting work they do. So it's largely for leaders and for consultants and for coaches. Um, okay, so <clears throat> this session today launches what will probably be a series of, of monthly sessions. And we'll say more about um, upcoming um, events and things that we're doing. But the two main questions that we wanna look at in today's session is, the first question is, what is what might we begin to understand or how might we begin to understand the nature of inner agility? I think uh, in a moment, I'll provide a, a provisional definition of inner agility. And the, and the second main question is, how can we catalyze its growth in ourselves and others, all right? That's a much tougher question. Um, so, um, so in doing the work of the session, um, this is not easy work to do, um, especially you know, trying to get this done inside 90 minutes. Um, these are deep ideas, they're challenging ideas because we have to introduce a vocabulary, we have to introduce a way of thinking to be able to even get on the court of this work. So, um, so I'm going to I'm going to be fairly demanding of your attention and of your kind of engagement with these ideas, and know that you don't have to necessarily quote understand everything. Part of it is just allowing it to find its way into you uh, in in whatever way that it does. Okay, so we'll start with a definition of inner agility, and sometimes I like to read these things. Inner agility refers to our capacity to make sense in the face of moments of surprise, ambiguity, and confusion, whether individually or collectively, in such a way that our actions fall naturally into a graceful dance with what is happening in those moments. 
It's to jump out of the loops that keep us stuck in what we already quote know in order to service what might be possible. Okay, so already in this definition, this definition is problematic because there's a lot of vocabulary we've already introduced. So what do we mean by capacity? What do we mean by make sense? What do we mean to be in a graceful dance with? I mean, it's a nice poetic thing, but what does it really mean? It actually means something, right? What does it mean loops that keep us stuck? What the heck could that be, right? Or what, does, what do we mean by already know? So in this talk, we're gonna, we're gonna begin to tease some of this stuff out. This is just gonna be a taste, right? We only have 90 minutes, you know, typically, you know, we have workshops and, you know, six or eight month programs where we develop this uh, uh, at a much uh, deeper way and a much more leisurely pace. So, um, so we're just gonna get a little bit of a taste of, of this stuff today. Okay, so as we explore these two main questions, what's the nature of inner agility and how do we bring it about? I wanna introduce two main ideas. And the first main idea is the notion of meaning making. And many of you have already encountered this term. It's a term from adult uh, developmental psychology. Um, the second idea is on the court versus in the stands. And those of you who've read um, Adaptive Leadership uh, by, uh, uh, his name escapes me right at the moment, um, um, probably have seen these terms. And so those are the two ideas that we're gonna be unfurling, we're gonna be unfolding during the course of this first uh, 50 minutes or hour. Okay, so let's start with meaning making. And I wanna just unpack this somewhat slowly. Um, so you could say that, um, that when we talk about human performance and ultimately what we're talking about here is human performance. So. I am a deep spiritual practitioner, as I know many of you are, right? And this work is spiritual in a way, but we don't use spiritual lingo. And I'm not going to get into why, um, but we use like the lingo of like performance. Like what does it mean to show up? Performance is really about how we show up in the world. That's, you know, simply said as, as, I, as I could say it. And there are two dimensions, uh, according to adult uh, developmental uh, theory, which, which um, I really like because it has a, a really powerful way of talking about the nature of the mind as it relates to human performance. And the first dimension is refer, uh, they call horizontal. I'm not quite sure why they call it horizontal, but horizontal refers to um, our competency, our skill, our ability, you know, the kind of action we're able to take and the kind of action we're not able to take. So there's certain ways in which we're not skillful or we're not competent. And all of this happens in the horizontal domain. And most training programs, most leadership books, most leadership training programs tend to operate in this domain. Although these days this is starting to change. The second dimension is referred to as vertical. And vertical, the vertical dimension has to do with how we make sense moment by moment of our experience. And you could say that the vertical, our capacity as it exists in the vertical dimension uh, determines to a great degree what we're able to do, the skillfulness we're able to bring to bear, the, the competency that we have. So the, so. And, and also the horizontal uh, dimension determines to a certain extent vertical. I'm not gonna get into all of that right now. The main thing that I wanna say right now is that the vertical dimension has to do with what in adult uh, or actually developmental psychology they refer to as meaning making. And meaning making is the background, um, hmm, it's a psychic organizing schema that basically makes it possible that rather than dealing with the infinitude of impulses that we that we are that have that we have coming in, whether from the outside, from the inside, you could imagine that that we're literally flooded with impulses and all kinds of information, all kinds of stuff coming in. And this meaning-making schema, it's a, kind of, it's a kind of schema 
that organizes all of that stuff into known categories or at least knowable categories. And so, so meaning making as determines our experience. So I want to emphasize that meaning making isn't like, you know, like a filter that happens that we have an experience and then it goes through an, a filter. No, literally our very experience moment by moment is determined, is given definition according to the particular meaning making schema that is operating within us. Now, meaning making is both an individual phenomenon and it's a socially constructed phenomenon. It's a, it's a way in which we operate together with other human beings. And it's an aspect of human consciousness that, um, that exists in all of us. It's literally the water that we swim in. Now, the thing that we could say, um, uh, I actually just add one last thing that meaning making is though it is probably the most ubiquitous you know, aspect of our psychology. So the, the aspect of our psychology that is the most ever present in our moment by moment experience, it is also that which is the most invisible. It's like an operating system in that way. The operating system, there's nothing on our devices that is using up cycles as much as the operating system. And yet we're completely unaware of the operating system um, we're unaware of its products, but we're unaware of it itself. And meaning making is kind of like that. It's literally embedded in our practices, our bodily movements. Who we are constituted to be is this meaning making. And so you could say that our meaning making makes us more than we make it. We have almost, to, to a certain degree, we have almost no choice in the, me in the meaning that we get made of. So who we are as human beings are like meaning-making machines and meaning-making makes us to the degree that we are unaware of uh, 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 that meaning-making that's making us. So the thing I wanna, um, so the next piece here around meaning-making is that Meaning-making tends to go into a kind of stuck record groove, all right? It's a kind of, it is, establishes a kind of equilibrium of patterns by which we make meaning of, of, of events and moments and situations and people. So there's a certain kind of pattern language that gets established that establishes a certain equilibrium and which in many ways is really good because it helps us be able to get on in life. Otherwise, we'd be having to, you know, kind of reconstruct reality moment by moment, right? So um, now the problem with that is that it is that it tends to reject novel uh, um, ex novel uh, inputs. So um, so so to the degree in to which our meaning making is sort of in this record groove, um, there are things that we actually don't notice that we don't uh, that we can't make sense of. And so, um, so we tend to get kind of stuck. Now, the beauty of, of, of this is that our meaning making, that equilibrium tends to evolve. So it tends, at some point, things start to happen and the old equilibrium breaks and a new equilibrium emerges. And as that new equilibrium emerges, we become capable of making sense of greater and greater complexity. And, and this is a phenomenon um, so you can see that, that, that as our meaning making becomes more and more com complex, it's represented by going further and further up uh, along the vertical line. And this phenomenon is referred to as development. This is what we mean by development. So on the horizontal axis, we refer to what happens as learning. And on the vertical axis, what we refer to it as development. Just gonna pause here. Uh, if you want to bring something in, Antoinette, how are we doing? Yeah, the uh, you know as you as you speak, um, it reminds me that uh, when something happens, we, we really attach to that meaning making, even though we don't know that we are and what it is, what you know what constitutes it. So so our experience of when something falls beyond the ability of our um, of our meaning making is generally to reject it, um, to, you know, to look at it and think, well, maybe we haven't, 
there's something wrong in the way we see it um, or we are missing some of the details or it's nonsense you know especially if it if it gets brought to us from the outside it's just nonsense um, you know it's we require more evidence so it's it's really hard it it creates a lot of angst inside us when um, you know when our meaning making gets stretched to its logical logical limits even though we are not aware um, that it's there and that it is the thing that is holding us back you know we we kind of blinded and blinkered by um by our meaning making in the moment so i noticed thank you so i noticed that there are um questions and comments in the chat um, those of you who know me know that i uh, pretty much ignore the uh, uh the chat um because i'm too busy doing other things um occasionally Antoinette will look in the chat and see so the way we're going to deal with questions is um if there are you know like um just kind of like something that you're stuck on um like a, the definition of a word or something like that um uh we may try to scoop some of those quite kind of questions up more substantive questions we'll have a q a uh, roughly around the top of the next hour uh, when, when that will start so this is this is um uh, I debated whether or not, you know, how to kind of do this today. And I've decided that I'm going to do this by just, in a sense, you know, giving you the entire arc of, 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 of this work. And, um, and uh, okay, great. So, all right. So we've been talking about meaning making as a kind of operating system, a kind of background schema. And so you could say that inner agility, so to bring the meaning making element uh, explicitly into our definition of inner agility, you could say that inner agility is a meaning-making capacity. So it operates, inner agility is that which operates in the vertical dimension. And it refers to a, the meaning-making capacity to make sense in the face of moments of surprise, ambiguity, and confusion, you know, and to be able from that way of making sense to be able to dance with um, whatever it is that's happening in the moment, including confusion, anxiety, whatever it is. Okay. So that was the first big idea. All right. The next big idea, uh, or the next, actually, that was the first question and the first big idea. Now, the second question, which is harder, and I'm going to rephrase it slightly, um, because we have a little bit, we have, we've introduced some new language that can help us be more uh, precise. So the question now is, how might we gain access to that meaning making dimension of being in order to increase our capacity for inner agility? So notice that phrase, gain access, that's going to be, that's going to make more sense as we move into this, because this is the, this is the thing that I noticed early on in my, uh, in my work with organizations is, um, in the early days, I would create leadership training programs. And I would present concepts about, you know, um, <laughs> about human development, stage development, and, you know, uh, or, or whatever. Um, but basically, this operated within the conceptual realm. And, um, and I find I found that people might understand the ideas, but they were unable to enact them, they were unable to embody uh, uh, what, what, um, any of this. And so this led me on to, you know, what ended up being a two decade Kind of research project to begin to understand the nature of human transformation. What is it that catalyzes human transformation? And of course, there are lots of ways to do that. My question around human transformation is focused on within the organizational environment, um, as opposed to say maybe going to uh, you know a, um, a meditation retreat or something. Okay, good. So this is the next question we want to dive into, and this is where we, we start to get. Um, uh, a little deeper into things. So, um, so the second main idea to support this question is is the diff, is the distinction on the court versus in the stands. Okay, and so let's just we're going to unpack this. We're going to introduce some philosophy. All right. So, <clears throat> you could say that there are essentially two ways of understanding. You know, so if we look at understanding reality, understanding situations, events things that concern us, there are two ways to understand them. 
One is epistemology, from the perspective of epistemology. And I'm taking a bit of a shortcut. So those of you who are trained in philosophy, you'll notice that I'm um, you know, playing fast and loose with this, with this term, but I'm doing it in order to make a certain point. So you could say that epistemology points to basically a conceptual way of understanding things. It's a way of understanding things in which knowledge is that which we gain. Knowledge is that which can be accrued can be grown, we can grow uh, our knowledge on, uh, on certain things. And epistemology tends to look at things from the outside. So if we look at leadership from the perspective of epistemology, we're looking at the concepts and the ideas and, and, and the skills and the abilities and how leaders think and all that kind of stuff. And all of that is in the domain of epistemology, right? Another way of understanding, very different, is phenomenology. And phenomenology is very different because phenomenology is about how things are happening in our experience. So at any given moment, we have an experience. There are things that are happening. Certain feelings come up. Certain thoughts come up. We find ourselves reacting to things in a certain way, and we don't necessarily even understand the nature of our reaction, right? But phenomenology points to the nature of our experience, and, and, um, and as a way of understanding leadership, it's about, you know, how leadership happens or doesn't happen in our moment by moment experience. So it's a different, you could say that phenomenology gives us a different point of access to things. Okay, good. So let, we're, gonna un, we're gonna take a moment to unpack this a bit. I wonder if I need to just pause. Sometimes just pausing. This can be a bit intense. How are we doing? Put your thumbs up if we're doing well. <laughs> okay, good. I see a few of you. I can't see everybody on my monitor right now. Okay, great. Okay, good. All right. So <clears throat> let's. So we're going to look at this through kind of two different um, arenas of human activity. The first is tennis, and the second one will be leadership. So we'll do tennis first because it helps us to kind of parse out these ideas uh, a little bit more clearly. So we're looking at the game of tennis. And, and in the game of tennis, you can look at tennis from two different places, from the stands or on the court, right? From the stands, what happens is that we're looking at that which can be observed from the outside. So for instance, I might be in the audience watching the tennis game and I'm watching the ball go back and forth and I'm kind of dazzled by the skillfulness if it's a professional game and you know it's very exciting being out there in the audience, you know, and there's all the stuff that's happening, right? So so that's one way in which tennis happens from the stands. Another way that it happens is if I'm really serious about tennis, I might study stat sheets on tennis players, or if I myself am a tennis player, I might study the, the stat sheets of those with whom I may be playing a match in the coming weeks, you know, I might watch videos of their game, you know, I might, you know, and, and, and by the way, I might also continue to, like, I might, I know I'm going to uh, have an opponent who has a really wicked right uh, serve, and so I'm going to develop my capacity uh, for, for my left backhand, or some, you know, by the way, I'm just making shit up, I don't know if any of this is accurately tennis. For those of you who are tennis players, please forgive my my, uh, my clumsy uh, rendering of this. But you get the idea. So it's it's um, it's from the outside, and um, whenever a comment comes up, it blocks my ability to go to the next uh, uh, slide. Okay, there we go. Um, also, you know, it could be um, like measure. So measuring. My 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 tennis game, you know, I might measure it like how how fast can I hit the ball, how fast a ball can I hit, or you know, like oh, so. There's all kinds of ways. These are all very valuable, right? Um, but there's another way of looking at tennis, which is on the court, and on the court is me playing tennis, and what's real when you're on the court is the ball is coming at you at 150 miles an hour and I might get killed by it. 
So on the court is the way, okay, so I'm gonna introduce a funny word here. The way in which the ball occurs for me, right? When I'm in a game of tennis or when I'm in the game of leading a webinar as I am right now, all that there is is what's occurring for me. What's occurring for me, you know, both in terms of my own feeling, I'm, you know, I'm noticing, you know, people's re facial reactions and it's, and, and in tennis, it's just what the way the ball occurs. That's ultimately, that's all that's real. So let's unpack this a little bit further. And we're going to ask a simple question. How fast is the ball moving? So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into this distinction between on the court and um, uh, from the stands. Okay, so if I'm what I'm interested in, which I am, is the ability to dance with the coming ball, right, which is kind of derives from our definition of inner agility, my ability to dance with the coming ball is my capacity for inner agility with respect to tennis, right? So that's what I'm interested in. All right, now, one way to kind of deal with that or one way to kind of measure it or understand it is in relation to the clocked speed of the ball. So for someone like me, I'm not even an amateur, I'd be like way below that line, but for someone like an amateur, a clocked speed of say 130 miles an hour would be like, it would be like, I wouldn't even see it. The amateur wouldn't even see it, let alone be able to respond to it, to be able to hit it. So the clock speed of that ball is way too fast. Whereas for the pro, the clock speed of 130 is probably completely doable. Okay, so that's, now the thing is, is that these two realms are unrelated. So from the perspective of playing tennis, the clocked speed, while it's interesting, is, is, is unrelated. And so it's really the clock speed is from the stands. It's tennis from the stands. And it's in the epistemological domain. It's what we can know and measure concisely. And even though we can concisely know and measure it, it may or may not have anything to do with my ability to dance with the coming ball. All right, so um, now there's a different way of, of asking the question or understanding the question, how fast is the ball going, All right? So we're still interested in our ability to dance with the coming ball, and we still can have the clock speed of the ball, but now we're gonna be dealing with something different, which is the speed of the ball as experienced, right? So we're not interested in the clock speed right now. We're interested in how fast is the ball, does it seem to be coming? And so I'm going to do these two lines now um, because of the way we had to set up these slides for Zoom. These lines should go really slow. So the line, uh, 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 the white line should be going up really slowly and the blue line should be going down very slowly. And what this is telling us is that as my ability to dance with the coming ball increases, my, the speed of the ball as I experience it slows down. So the um, so on the court, there is no clock speed of the ball. All there is is the speed of the ball as I'm experiencing it. By the way, you may be wondering why the hell am I talking about this? We'll come to that in a moment. Just hang with this, all right? All right. Um, so this is tennis on the court, right? And this is tennis from the perspective of phenomenology, which is from the perspective of my experience of that ball. So what matters from the perspective of phenomenology is, my, is the speed of the ball as I experience it, or in other words, as it is occurring for me. Okay, all right, so consider. If what we're after is access to the vertical dimension of performance, we're gonna to need to do so through this domain of occurring. I'm going to assert that the epistemological domain, the domain of measuring from the outside, looking from the outside, concepts, ideas, 
will not improve my game of tennis. So that's an assertion that I'm making. Okay, all right, so now let's look at this in relation to the game of leadership, all right? Something closer to you know, the topic at hand. All right, so from the stands, there are all of these different ideas. So how agile leaders think, systems thinking, how to communicate more inclusively, even leadership agility. So I used to teach leadership agility with Bill Joyner years ago and um, great work, participative leadership, polarity management. All of this is important work. That which can be, but it is still that which can be observed from the outside. It comes from the domain of epistemology. And while obviously these things are key to leaderful effectiveness by themselves, they can't provide access to that vertical dimension of being that's key to masterful leadership in a VUCA world. I'm not, see, be, I'm gonna be clear what I'm saying and not saying, I'm not saying that this stuff is not valuable and important, it is key. And if what we're looking for is to be able to lift my capacity for inner agility, which we are saying is a vertical capacity, we need a different point of access. And the point of access, as, as, as you're probably detecting, I'm getting to, is that which occurs on the court. So leadership on the court happens in this moment, happens in the moment of a conversation, happens in the moment of sense-making, of shared sense-making, happens in the moment when I have a commitment to influence the outcome of something. And all of that is um, the way in which situations occur for us, that the domain in which we encounter leadership as a vertical capacity is in that uh, arena in which things occur for us or uh, in the epistemological realm. Okay, so here's an example. I can say, and many of you probably do, so check it out for yourself. I often find myself saying something to the effect of, I believe in open and honest communication. That's who I am. As a leader, I believe in honest and open communication. I would assert that that is a statement of espousal. I'm espousing something which may or may not be true, right? And as an espousal, it comes from the stands. And it's a, that which can be observed. This is distinct from in those moments when the meeting is tense or when I'm feeling anxious, what's, what I really believe is that if I open my mouth in this meeting, if I say something, I'll get into trouble. And that's my visceral feeling. That's my experience. So check this out for yourself, by the way, right? You may be somebody who believes in open and honest communication, but when push comes to shove, there are those moments when you keep your mouth shut out of some kind of fear because you believe that something terrible will happen if you open your mouth. And this is on the court. This is who we are on the court this is the domain of occurring. This is the phenomenological domain. Okay, so one is a belief that I have, that I espouse, that I can point to and say, that's what I say that I believe. And the other is what I really believe. It's a belief that has me. And for the most part, I am unaware that that belief is even there until it gets activated in some particular moment. So, still encountering, every time someone makes a comment, it blocks the arrows, so I can't yeah. use the, the thing, it's uh, yeah. Michael, just see, there's a little up arrow next to the chat at the bottom of your screen. And uh -huh. just see if you, if you click on, it has an option to show chat previews. Just see yeah. if, you, if you click on that, whether it, whether it solves it for you. Yeah, I don't see that, so. That's okay. It's not, okay. It's not, yeah. okay. So, so go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so, you know, as I, um, as we go through this, 
Um, I've been doing um, quite a lot of work on model development for coaches. You know, how do how do I develop my model? What's in my model? Um, most of us don't even know that we use a model. The same thing, you know, we uh, these things develop for us intuitively, um, you know, and without much thinking. And not only are we unaware of them, um, we are in all, you know, they are constraining without us, um, without us even realizing. And because we don't realize that they are there, we also don't make use of the very uh, great ability to observe and reflect on the difference between that which we espouse and that which we ex exhibit in the moment, you know. Um, so any chance of learning needs to start with being aware of what what are those beliefs? What are, how do I make meaning? So that I then can start comparing what I think I do, what I think I believe in, how I think I act with what really happens in the moment in order to expand um, my repertoire, whether that's horizontal, because some something that's also necessary to say is that our vertical development also enables further horizontal development. You know what be, what becomes possible for us when we're at one level of vertical de uh, development horizontally, um, you know, gets enhanced. So both from a from the perspective of how we are and what we do, um, we need to be we need to come into the realization of what is going on for us. We really need to, um, the first step really is to start discovering what beliefs have me yeah. before we can do anything. Yeah. And and the thing is, is that it's, it's that's tricky to do, right? Um, we're, um, I use the term smart rats to describe people who've been exposed to a lot of these sorts of ideas, personal development ideas, and when we throw around terms, you know, and they're meaningful terms, I don't mean to malign any of this, um, but our egoic mind is really tricky. And it is happy to take on any terms that we wanna use to develop and improve ourselves and use it as a way to defend itself against that development. And so this is partly why we make such, we're making such painstaking efforts because what I've observed and what I've seen in the programs that I lead over these last years is that you actually have to sneak up on people. We have to sneak up on ourselves. We have to come around from an angle that the egoic mind is not expecting. And what that means is oftentimes we have to, we have to present things in ways that don't make sense to the categorizing epistemological mind. And this is why we make such a big deal about phenomenology here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm gonna assert once again, that the primary vehicle for access, accessing this, the vertical dimension of being is by means of what's occurring, by how situations and events actually show up. So that's kind of like the portal. All right, so I wanna offer us, um, and, and I want to emphasize that last point, uh, actually, that uh, because we don't, we're not really talking about this uh, in this um, uh, talk, although maybe it'll come, back, come up in the, in the conversation that we do, uh, <clears throat> which is the importance of introducing questions and vocabulary and distinctions that stand ordinary understanding on its head. Right, so saying things in a way that are even confusing for people. Confusion, uh, incidentally, as many of the yogi and uh, um, Buddhist masters have told us, confusion is the last portal before you get to enlightenment. That you actually have to unscramble all the known categories to be able to, to see uh, what's actually going on. All right, so. So here's an example. We're not going to do this activity here because we don't have time. But I want to present, you know, just to give a little taste of how we might uh, do such a, a, an activity if we had more time. Um, so 
this is, um, this is an activity that's related to a challenge, all right? So we all have challenges, right? We, people challenge us, situations, events, all kinds of things, challenges, circumstances. And I'm gonna say that a challenge is an area of stuckness that persists no matter what you try, okay? Just to put it simply, how I understand a challenge is an area of stuckness that persists no matter what you quote try. Note that I put the word try in quotes. Um, to work with an area of stuckness that persists, you must have a way to step outside the structure of embeddedness that keeps that stuckness in place. In other words, we need to find a way to sneak into it. Um, otherwise, the egoic mind is just going to take over and um, just use whatever language you're throwing at it to, to defend itself against getting this thing unstuck. So, so um, okay. So, so again, if we were doing this as an activity, you can actually start to do this and, and we'll share the slides with you um, after the session. Um, so think of a situation or a relationship where you feel stuck. It could be big, could be small and write down a full description. So um, you might, uh, once I, so this is gonna be a build. Once I get all of these up, you could do a screenshot of it if you wanna do this right after the session, which I would recommend. It'll take us a while to get the slides to you. Okay, so the um, okay, so it's, so you will have written down the full description. Now, here's the first question: What emotional pattern does this situation or person trigger in you? What feelings? What story about people or about yourself? You want to be really honest. Write this down. Incidentally, I say write this down. This is often a great practice to do with another person. And this gets into you know, how to create environments that support this work, which we're not gonna get into today unless someone has a question about it. Um, okay, so now the next question, once you've dealt with that question is, um, now ask yourself this, what deeply though privately held belief or truth about you, about people, about life, about the world gets validated by this challenging situation or relationship? In other words, in what ways might you benefit from the persistence of this stuckness? Be honest and write this down or discuss it with a partner. And then the, the final question is, now ask yourself, in what ways would you have to give up your attachment to the stuckness of that situation? So what this is suggesting, what this line of questioning is suggesting is, the possibility that challenges persist because there's some benefit we get from the stuckness that it creates in our life. We get a benefit from it. We get something from it. It's kind of like a racket that, you know, we say that we're doing one thing, but we're really doing something else, right? We say we don't want that challenge, but there's something that we're up to, that the egoic mind is up to that keeps the stuckness of that challenge around. Right, so that's the, that's the sort of line of inquiry. And this is a kind of line of inquiry. So the way this works is you're not looking for a fast answer to this. You're looking to have these questions be in the background for yourself. So over the course of the next several days, as you continue to engage with that challenge or that challenging relationship, um, hold these questions in the background as a kind of inquiry, as a place to look. It's a kind of, you could think of it as a container to put this challenge or this challenging situation, or this challenging relationship in the container that holds these questions. And notice what shows up. Notice what you see. Notice what happens, right? Invariably, if you engage in this kind of inquiry, literally the inquiry itself shifts the manner in which the world is occurring. It's so, and, and this I think gets to the final point that I wanna make here that, um, <clears throat> the nature of this kind of work is that it alters the way that you see the world such that the world starts to occur differently for you. So that's what, that's what we mean by transformation. Transformation is that which happens 
when those people out there get better. It's like one of my favorite jokes about, uh, I attended this transformational workshop. It was a deep transformational workshop. It was one of those ones where, you know, it was like, you know, four days, we were up till three o'clock in the morning and hurling ourselves off of cliffs and ropes and, you know, really, really coming to grips with our demons and going deep and, you know, to cathartic. And, and, and then, you know, I get home and guess what happens? Everyone else got better. I did the work, but everyone else got better. <laughs> and so that's the nature of this sort of work. If we want to influence the vertical dimension that, by, that, that gives our capacity for inner agility, it's this kind of work uh, that we need to engage in. So I'm just going to add one last thing. Um, um, hmm. I wonder if we even want to do this. Uh, do we even want to do this one? Antoinette, what do you think? Or should we I'm thinking that, that it, yeah, I think uh, let's, um, let's have a little bit of a discussion because it's, it yeah. opens up something else. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a right. new. Right, right. okay. May, so may, maybe, maybe, my, Michael, maybe we can, you know, we could just say that the, you know, you spoke earlier about um, that we can't do it for ourselves or that we really struggle to do it for ourselves, right. you know, right. and um, right. we need help in order to do this work. So we need um, we need others that can reflect to us. Um, we need others uh, that can help us make sense because of that stuck record. Um, we really benefit from having different viewpoints, different um, different languaging of um, of what's going on for us. So and you know and. Um, maybe what I can share with the rest of you as well is um, when I seriously started getting interested in this work, I was part of a group of, uh, I think there were six of us that would get together on a, on a weekly basis and, um, and do collective sense making, you know, or, and, um, and how, how subtle the changes happen for one when, um, when the focus starts moving from what you know from, from if I use your the, the terminology that you use in this um, in this talk from 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 the stands versus to being on the court um, so you can't do this by yourself mm -hmm. or with great difficulty yeah and so in in a future um uh, session we're going to uh, yeah 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 exactly we're, we're going to talk about what's the what's the what are the qualities we need to create in order to be able to do this kind of work because they require very specific kind of alchemy of of qualities and and there's and there's um there's a really clear way to talk about that and uh, so um that's going to come in the in the next um webinar that we do. This is kind of a series of webinars, you know, around the question of developing our inner agility, both uh, individually and collectively. Okay, so, um, whew. <laughs> so let's, let's turn this, let's turn this into uh, like a conversation. And uh, it could, you could think of it as this is the Q&A part portion of the session. And, um, and we'll see how Q&A issue is or versus how conversational it is. Um, uh, so let's uh, start with um, somebody has a question or a comment uh, that, that you want to offer, and that'll kick us off. And please, if you can, turn on your um, uh, uh, your um, camera. Videos, yeah, your camera. Yeah, your video. And also, I think maybe we can unmute uh, people just so we mm, I've, can yeah. I've asked people. everybody to unmute. Great. And if you're in a noisy environment, do keep yourself muted. But if you're not, uh, mute yourself. Okay. Right. So, so I'm wondering, Jeff. Um, Jeff, you start. You asked two questions in in the chat. I'm wondering. The first one is why is making sense a quality that we need to aspire to? Um, and do we need to make sense of something to experience development? And I'm wondering whether those questions are still alive for you? Absolutely. Um, Go for it. You know, and I could, if, if I were to munch those two together, 
um, you know, it sounds like, you know, I'm, is making sense of something a prerequisite to development? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, hello, Jeff. It's good to see you. How you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing really, really well. I'll, I, to this day, I remember the, the evening when you played the oud. And, uh, it was so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, so is, oh, can you say the question again? Because I was so overwhelmed by being present. Yeah, is, is well, the first thing, thing is, is, you know, when, when you presented the whole statement out, Right, you actually underline making sense is something that that we had to unlock, had to uncover, and it's not. I, I'm for me, it's not uncovered yet because I'm uh -huh. here. I, I don't know what making sense. Uh -huh. Why that is so important to development? Yeah, 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 yeah great. Okay, and so here's, here's you know, and it, okay, you got it. Yeah, 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 I get it. So here's so here's so here's the thing, uh, Jeff that um, we are always making sense. We are never not making sense. We, what you could actually say is that sense is always making us. So sometimes I use the term sense making and meaning making interchangeably. Technically they're different. Um, but at any given moment, sense is already making us. Now the question becomes, um, can we, to what degree can we be aware of the sense-making that's making us and be deliberate about that sense-making that's making us so that we can become choiceful in relation to that? So I don't know if that answers the question, um, may answer a different question you didn't ask. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that, that kind of answers, answers my question. It, it, it's kind of, you know, I, I frankly found myself feeling a little defensive uh, on on the yeah. term of sense on this thing of sense making, yeah, yeah. Um, uh -huh. yeah. and, and practicing yeah. as an agile coach. Yeah, this is actually just for that phrase. If somebody told on a team says we got to make sense of this, I would probably suggest that maybe you don't. Yeah, <laughs> right. And now I understand. When, when you make something value valuable, you experience something, right? Yeah, yeah. And if there's sense to be made, that sorry for the background noise. Um, if if there's something to come out of it, sense to be made, that sense often reveals itself through the experience of something valuable, yeah, yeah. and not you know it's so making sense of a situation feeling you need that often gets in the way. Right, okay, good. So there's a different use of the make, making sense. So we're using a word in two completely different ways, right? So the common mm -hmm. way that we use the term making sense could be like the question, um, so did what I just say make sense, Jeff? So that's the common way that we use that term, right? A different way, to ask a question could be, so what's the nature of the sense you make of what I just said? And this is a way in which sense making becomes a way of investigating how we think and how we operate and to uncover and to expose potentially some of the beliefs and assumptions and theories that may be informing the way in which we're making sense at any given moment. Got it. Okay. Is that helpful? It is. I mean, we could talk for hours. Yes, we could. <laughs> yes, I could. know. Because and see, I here's the thing: if we had time right now, uh, yeah. Chuck, we would we would move this into a more personal realm, right? Got it. Um, yeah. Because it's it's a bit conceptual right now. We've already moved into the domain of epistemology and out of the domain of how this occurs for you, and and so we would want to, if we had the time. Uh, uh, we would want to unpack that, you know, like what, what's, what is it about that? Uh, because there's a trigger there for you somehow. And um, whenever we feel ourselves being defensive, I would assert that there's some kind of a trigger. And right, uh, absolutely. So we'd want to uncover that, right? And by the way, we would do that in a very friendly way. Um, 
but you know, but but also in a um, I like the word ruthless compassion in a, a compassionate way, but also like really looking you know, really clearly at it. Right. Got it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah great. Thank okay. You. We're cool to move hey, on. Thank you, Mike. Michael, I have a question. Sean Buck here. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the thing that maybe stands out to me, and I don't want to oversimplify the model, but is there an element of learning by doing versus learning by books, right? So when you get thrown into the fire, yep. you know, that's, you have to make sense of your environment. You're seeing things differently than book smart, or like you learn a class or, or you learn agile, you go to a scrum workshop and you learn agile, right? And you're like, oh, I know how to do all this. And then you're in it and you're like, oh my gosh. And then that's where the true learning kind of happens. Is that an oversimplification or? No, not at all. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, um, <clears throat> it, it points to the nature of that where this kind of work happens is in the domain of occurring and the, in the domain of occurring. Okay. So um, you're making me wish that I had revealed the model uh, that I was thinking of revealing, but we don't, wouldn't have <laughs> it anyways, but, but yeah. part of, part of what we need to do when we create what we call a deliberate sense-making environment, Sean, is right. that we need to create what we call heat experiences which is experiences that stretch beyond our currently known categories. So, and, and I believe that's what you're talking about, which is kind of a, like, the, you know, the, you, know um, you say dropping the person into the deep end so that they have to learn to swim. Now we wanna accompany that with a reflective um, um, activity, an activity that helps people observe what it is that's making this difficult for them. What it is, what meaning making is there such that whatever it is they're experiencing is challenging. And it's only if we do those things together. Yes, it's the doing part. It's the throwing the person into the deep end and providing an atmosphere in which there's a kind of a rigorous commitment to uncovering what's there um, that, that the transformational possibility can be realized. If we just throw something, somebody into the deep end, you know, they may make it, but they, but they may or may not experience a personal transformation along the way. They may just become a better swimmer. Does that, yeah. does that make no, sense? That's a good point. I mean, that's, that's kind of going back to my military days. It's sort yeah. of how we operate. We're, we're thrown into the fog of war in situations, but we have after action reports where we reflect on what we learned and that, I think that, that, that's a good point because if you throw some of the deep end it could go multiple ways they could have a negative experience uh, or they could have a positive experience and you're the, as the coach or the shaman or the guide right your goal because I remember you did this really well for us right um, y y a lot of people would say he's just not telling me what to do and it's like he just it, whenever I ask him a question he asked me a question back right but you were always there as a safety net to help them is reflect on their experiences. So that, I think that's the key thing. Instead of just being thrown to the fire, it's like, I'm going to throw you in the fire, but I'm going to protect you from being burnt in yeah. a way and yeah. help you. Yeah, well, we want to protect you from being burned and we want you to stay in the fire, right? Yeah. Now, now the thing I would um, uh, say very briefly um, uh, uh, is that rather than having an after experience reflection, um, I want to include reflection as part of the experience. Mm, okay. So uh, I find that it's much more powerful. And, you know, and just so you know, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a hurry to transform human consciousness. And so any way that I can find a shortcut uh, to doing that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. All right. Great, really beautiful question, wonderful. So we have a couple of hands raised, so I wanna just honor that. I think Anaga came in uh, first, uh, so please, Anaga. Um, well, so this is my first time with you, and I want to applaud you for your structure, that you have left enough time for participants to come and, and get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so big thumbs up for, for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thank you. going back a little bit, uh, I think it was Jeff who said, who asked this question about uh, if sense-making is prerequisite to development. And uh, 
two things briefly. One is uh, uh, like if we talk about child development, uh, sense making is more like a higher brain function. So the development first happens physically before they can start making sense because their brain is not developed. Um, and, uh, and that's hardwired in, in all of us, not just human beings. Uh, so, so not necessarily is one answer if we look at child development. Mm -hmm. uh, another answer is my personal experience. I'm about sense making and it was a hard way to learn that not everyone needs it and not everyone is wired like me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, there are enough number of people, I used to look at them like, okay, what the hell are they talking about? It doesn't make sense. And they were looking at me like, what the hell she is talking about? But because it doesn't have to make sense. Uh, and that was not their primary way of operating. Right, right. So what you're pointing to, yeah. um, what you're pointing to, uh, um, uh, Anaga, is that people make meaning or make sense um, that the sense making or meaning making that informs how they are in the world um, it's, it's diff there, there are differences and um, uh, and stage development theory tells us you know, a little bit about how these different ways of making meaning are different and one of the things that we one of the things I have found really valuable in studying stage developmental theory is to come to be able to understand the way different people operate and think and to be able to speak in that language that is accessible to them, but has little Trojan horses in it. Um, and I'm not gonna explain the reference to Trojan horse, you'll have to look it up. But a Trojan horse basically is that you implant an idea that looks like something that's familiar to somebody, but when they look at it closely, it's something different. And it has the quality of opening something up in the other person, but that can only happen when where we're coming from is a place of true compassion, which is the willingness and the ability to truly allow another person into us and to be able to be humble enough to speak their language and to also understand that there's, there's some people who's, there's some meaning making equilibria who, you know, that I, that, that, that I can't speak to it and or I don't feel like I have the time to speak to. Not that I don't, I'm not friendly with them, but in terms of, you know, like people that I coach or people that I work with. Um, right, and, and I'm not very familiar with the things that you said just now. I might be if we go in deeper, I don't know. Uh, for me, this sense making and not sense making is more equivalent to introverts and extroverts. If you talk to extroverts, they will say, what do you mean by not speaking? And if you talk to introverts, they will say, why do you need to speak? Yeah. Um, and it, and it's, it's how they're wired in their brain. And I think sense making and not sense making is hardwired in the brain uh, that some people absolutely need it and that's how they operate and some people don't and that's how they operate. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot, there'd be a lot, and if we had time, we would unpack that. <laughs> and we would unpack that in, in relation to you personally. Um, uh, like, you know, because you have your foot nailed to the floor around something. There's a theory that you have about something. And, um, and that theory may be blinding you in some way. All right. And, uh, you know, we're not going to dive into it, but I'm just going to kind of leave that with you for something you can completely, you know, you know, reject it if it doesn't, if it doesn't fit. Thank you, Aga. So Steve's had his hand up for quite a while. Yeah, indeed, he has. And so has Sam and... Uh, uh, yeah, I think Sam had his hand up yeah. before me. So go ahead, Sam. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Hey, thanks, Steve. Um, so, Michael, it's... Um, sometimes there is a lot of pain, right? When you see that 
you are facilitating a conversation, for example, between let's say two departments, each of them have their own um, vision, which they hold closely to. And often let's say they are conflicting and, and as a coach, you see both of them um, not being able to achieve that shared understanding, still sticking to their own positions and, and not being able to get outside of their boundaries, right? Um, how do you deal with that? pain like and it 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 it's like every moment right there is a desire so for um, you so for you yes. sorry, sorry to interrupt so for you when that happens it's painful mm -hmm. yeah 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 you realize that for other people when that when they when that happens it's not necessarily painful for them yes right yeah. so there's nothing inherently painful about mm -hmm. this See, I'm pointing to you. See, we always have to start with ourselves at some point, mm -hmm. really, because there's something, there's something about, there's something that underlies that trigger of pain that makes it hard for you to be present. Yeah. And if you can't be present in the midst of something like that, you're not, you can't possibly be helpful. All your efforts yes. to be helpful will just simply be, you're basically, you're basically operating in relation to your own projections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. makes sense so, so so we need to start and again if we had more time we would unpack the nature of that pain and i would assert that there was something that happened to you at some point in your life maybe a couple different points in your life that mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and you made a decision or something in you like maybe a five-year-old child or something in you made a decision and that decision became the meaning making context in which these particular kinds of situations show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're taking a shortcut through something that, you know, we would take some time to unpack, but you're, but you're getting what I'm saying, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much. Great, great, mm -hmm. great. Thank you for that. Beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful. Awesome. Okay. Steve, Petro, good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? Um... For me, um, just it, it sounds like you have to have this compassion awareness, and I'm, I'm going to call it intimacy. And what I mean by that is like uh, getting more in tune with your experience, but also what's bubbling up inside. And I think it's been talked about in various questions before. But it, but am I grasping that correctly? In that like you really want to. That's why it's better to be with somebody else because they can help you get out of that that repetible record pattern that you're in yeah. and you need to be in a state where you can be aware of all that while they are you know compassionately and intimately holding <coughs> whatever space for you to learn that and vice versa yeah, am yeah. i capturing that correctly or well um you're capturing something and i'm not i'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure what it is but let me let me respond to um uh, yeah. what, what you're saying regardless of what it may be capturing um <clears throat> that it's not enough, I would say, to simply have like a rap session with somebody right. about stuff, right? That's part of like having a conversation, certain kind of conversation with somebody is a key part of it. But another aspect of this is um, the meaning making distinctions that we, um, that's the currency, if you will, of our conversation, like the meaning making currency as in money currency, you know, so, so there's a meaning making currency that operates that determines the way in which we have conversations. And one of the things that we need to be able to do, and that that we actually is an an aspect of what we do in the Center for Inner Agility is we need to have invent distinctions that alter the currency so that the, con the nature of the conversation gets transformed. And now here's the, here's the kicker. When you change the currency of the conversation through the introduction of certain distinctions, 
you create moments of disorientation, people will get confused. And that confusion, that disorientation is a necessary part of this process called um, uh, bringing about a shift in our own inner meaning making. Thank you. And that has to be deliberately done. And there's a certain kind of, we need to be able to exercise a certain kind of human technology is the term I use for it. It's a, it's a set of very deliberate um, uh, um, actions, um, conversational actions that um, in a sense, throw us off and, and help and introduce a different currency. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, to Mr. Ken Roberts, good to see you, man. Well, it's good to see you too, Michael. So I have a, a, an interesting question. It's a little off topic, I guess, or not quite. I noticed you said you're in a hurry to transform human consciousness. Is that, is the intent behind that to create a deliberately developmental space for the center for inner agility or is it um is there something else that's driving that um that hurry that need oh that hurry yeah mm -hmm. yeah well it, it's 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 <laughs> it's mostly it's primarily just because um uh you know we could potentially sink uh, this iteration of human civilization could potentially sink. And um, if that's the destiny of human being, whether this, whether this iteration of human civilization sinks doesn't necessarily mean that it sinks human being necessarily. Um, uh, I, 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 I would speculate anyways, right? So, but in the interest of, you know, the sort of, what's happening in the world, I feel a sense of urgency, you know, to accelerate the rate at which um, we're able to grow the complexity of our meaning making so that more of us become capable of both um, effective action in the domains in which we are in crisis and to inspire and educate other people um, to, to develop their own meaning making. And so the, the mission of, of the Center for Inner Agility, which I, I think we should probably get to that in just a moment, shouldn't we, Antoinette? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Does, that, does, that, um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Like what I'm hearing is the intent to develop a ripple effect. Yes, yes. Through um, building vertical development well developing so Not vertical development, but the way that we approach our meaning making yes yes that's it's right that's right that's right <laughs> you know it's like you know what you, you know how you've grown and how you impact other people over the course of the years is essentially really what this mm -hmm. is about you know that that i've had teachers and i've had um environments in which I've been able to develop myself, which has made it possible for me, you know, to do somewhat similar work with other people. And, 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 that, and that's how this, this, this seems to go. At least this is the, this is the, you know, this is the game that, you know, that I'm in and that we're in right now. Right, awesome, thank you. Yeah, and these, 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 um, there's an organic, uh, organic nature to this. You know, there's there's um there's no there's no way that you can create an appetite in those that are not ready. An appetite grows, life grows an appetite within people. Mm -hmm. Um disorienting events, um, whether that's uh the loss of a loved one or right. climate crisis or the pandemic or losing your job. That's those are disorienting events. So there's there's um, it's necessary to create How would you a know? place. How would I know, Jeff? Oops, I'm sorry. I was looking at something else. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I apologize. I wasn't muted. 
<laughs> yeah, well, if we had more time, I could tell you I could answer that. But um, I trust but you really fully. <laughs> <laughs> no, Chief, no problem, no problem. So, um, so there, you know, the if there is a if there is a need, if they if that um, organically that first um, develops, then wouldn't it be wonderful if um, there is some somewhere that you can go and quench your thirst? Because for a lot of us, for a lot of our lives, that wasn't available. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can see that. I don't, I don't want to hold up the time because I know you don't, you're, you're tight yeah. on time. That you're right. There's yeah. a lot of disorientation going on right now. So that creates opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. That's great. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like so, a number of you have heard, heard heard us say often, very often, that you know that in order for there yeah. to be a breakthrough, we need to we need to we need to have a breakdown. Breakdowns breakdown. are, yeah. are necessary yeah. for breakthrough. So now, okay, good. So here's here's what I want to propose because there are still um, people who want to we, yeah. uh, engage in some um, conversation, and we have a little bit that we want to do before we end the session. Um, I don't know about you, Antoinette. Um, I can stay for a few minutes past yes. the bottom of the hour, yes. our official end time, uh, but probably only about five minutes since uh, there's something I'm gonna need to deal with. Um, yeah. so, um, so for those of you whose hands are open, if you could just hold on for a few minutes while we do this last bit of stuff, I'm gonna, um, hold on, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do the screen share a little bit differently this time, uh, Antoinette, because the other one takes, takes time. Yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the basic screen sharing. Sometimes I have to talk a lot when I'm doing these things because I get so befuddled otherwise. Okay, so, all right, good. So we wanna say something about um, the Center for Inner Agility and we've been kind of you know, mentioning it and, um, and we would be remiss in not saying something about it uh, in the session. So the mission of the Center for Inner Agility is to leverage cutting edge research from these a, a variety of fields like professional executive coaching, developmental psychology, transformative learning and relationship systems coaching. And there's probably others that we can throw in there in order to synthesize a human technology, which is, we, I really think of a technology as a set of practical tools and distinctions, right? And we usually associate technology with engineering, uh, with in the epistemological realm, right? And this is a human technology in the phenomenological realm, in the realm in which um, life occurs, right? So this is a technology, a set of tool, practical tools and distinctions in the domain in which life is occurring uh, in whatever, uh, um, whatever arena is of concern to us in order to grow um, uh, inner agility or to grow uh, agile minds and culture from the inside out. So that's the that's the mission. And who we are right now uh, is um, uh, myself, Antoinette Cotier, and uh, Esbjorn Hiltefers, who is in Greece right now um, uh, on a holiday, and so he couldn't be with us. So, um, so I want to just let you know what's coming up. Uh, and um, those of you who are in our community, one of the big things that will be coming up is we'll be, we're going to, we, a big part of the center is about creating community and uh, a community of interest and a community of practice. And in the coming weeks, we're gonna share a little bit more about how that might look. It's still sort of emerging for us. Uh, but meanwhile, I just wanna share, you know, just some, some announcements of things that are coming. So we have um, uh, some things that are coming in the coming weeks. Uh, we have a clinic, these are all free events. Uh, we have this clinic called the So What of Evolve Agility. Those of you who have read the book, those of you who have maybe engaged in some of the practices and have, um, over the years, we haven't really, um, uh, um, I've been remiss in um, um, stimulating that work. So that, so the So What of Evolve Agility is basically a set of sessions in which we go more deeply into the practices of Evolve Agility and we share with you, you know, what's new uh, with Evolve Agility. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, we'll be doing another webinar part two of this, the series of which this is part one, which is accessing inner agility, the design of deliberate sense-making environments. So how do you actually design environments to facilitate this? So we'll probably review a little bit some of the ideas here and then uh, dive more deeply into the, uh, uh, how, to actually, how to actually do this. 
Um, and then finally, we're going to have a practicum called Conversations Matter. And um, this is where we uh, will dive more deeply into um, specific conversational practices. And conversational practices is another of those elements. So you, if you think of deliberate sense-making environments as a kind of um, uh, synthesis of different elements, one of the elements and key to, to it is uh, is conversational skillfulness, skillfulness in conversation and in relationship. And um, for the most part, we're actually, most of us are not that skillful uh, at that. I know I'm not. Um, so you'll find me there. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so coming a bit later um, is uh, a program. Uh, this is for people who've been through um, uh, another program, Inner Path or the um, Enterprise Transformation Leader Program. This is a, what we call a graduate program and uh, manifesting your calling, which is about how to um, literally bring about that which you've always thought was impossible and how to create the conditions both within yourself and the world around you to make the impossible real. And so that's manifesting your calling. That will start in early September sometime. The next one is uh, Path to Inner Agility. It's another cohort program. And it's kind of like the keystone of this whole, uh, uh, of, of, of this whole enterprise. Um, it's a six month um, intense uh, program where you, uh, where we basically dive much more deeply into the work we've just had a tiny little taste of here, uh, which is really about growing your capacity, uh, um, both within yourself in relationship and, and, and in the systems in which you operate. And then, um, Conversation, communication, relationship. It's a, a four day workshop that uh, Antoinette and I will be leading. Uh, starts in early October. And that's going to be a, a very, very deep dive into conversational and dialogical and relationship practices. And then finally, um, I'll see what's the final thing here? I can't remember. Oh, right. And of course, other free community events, clinics, and practicums will, will, will continue to offer. And again, um, at some point, we'll, we'll have some sort of a platform to facilitate uh, interaction uh, among uh, people within this community. And we'll have other kinds of things that we'll be announcing in order to engage people at different levels of depth in this community. So this is your community as much as it is our business. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to say here. Antoinette, is there anything else that should be said? Uh, no, I think you pretty much covered it. I mean, we're going to see one another again in um, for, I mean, we, we plan to offer webinars at this point, at least every month, but there are multiple ones. And if you haven't signed up, um, you know, we'll be sending communication your way if you want to send, uh, sign up for the other ones. So, yeah. and, um, and to join the community. We really encourage yeah. people to join the community. Yeah. Um, um. yeah. All right. Yeah, and you can, you can, ex you can expect to, um, to receive the slides. Just give us, we are doing this incrementally and iteratively. So <laughs> I'm sure some of you have at least heard of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's been an enormous number of things we've been putting together uh, these, these weeks. Uh, the So Wet webinar are two different. Uh, all right, okay, so this is actually a good question or it's a valid question. Um, are the two dates of the So Wet the same webinar or two different in a series? It's, it, 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 it's it, they're in a series. So it's a series of three sessions and you could join all three of them, or you could hop on, you know, uh, uh, some and, and maybe not the other. And um, um, uh, it's pro it's like th these are going to be more improvisatory, and um, uh, um, uh, so and it's likely that each one will sort of build on um, what got created before. And of course, we'll always have a way to sort of recap uh, what had happened before to answer that question. Um, okay, so there are other questions. I don't know, maybe we could somehow collect questions and we can respond in an email uh, at some point next week because um, uh, there's too many questions and they're all good questions that probably yeah. deserve an answer. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think we're at our time and I wanna just honor, uh, uh, I just wanna say for, um, we, again, we can, I can stay on for about um, 
maybe seven or 10 minutes at the most. Um, so for those of you who still have questions or would like to you know, just stay on, you're welcome to. But the, for those of you who'd like to leave, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, thank you for um, mm -hmm. thank you for being here. Thank you for engaging in this work. Thank you for whatever it is you're committed to, such that you um, were willing to spend 90 minutes of your beautiful Friday afternoon on a, in, a, in the middle of summer um, to engage in this conversation. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 <laughs> yeah, do, do say goodbye as you leave, just so because you pop out the mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye -bye. Great to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As we say, you, hey, do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and again, if you'd like to stay on, uh, um, again, we could probably do about another seven to ten minutes. Okay, all right. So, Hello. bye, bye, Michael. Bye, Sabina. Bye, Sabina. Bye, nice bye. to see you. We'll see you again soon. Yes, soon. Bye, bye. Bye. <laughs> Okay, so there are, oh wow, look, just a handful is still here. Um, this is a hard. Oh, they fit on one screen. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that fantastic? <laughs> There's one blank, it's like a blank box here. I don't even know who's there. There's no name or anything. Anyone else see that? No. Okay, must be some weird artifact. Okay, great. So we have a few minutes. Um, who would like to offer a comment or a question or a follow-up? Or maybe we just want to hang out. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, kind, of, kind of the future, from, from my perspective, it's been about helping other people to grow. Uh, and growing myself is a part of that. So I, I'm curious about the direction of this. Is it, is it other-centric where we are a part of it? Or is it my own growth-centric and the rest is just a byproduct. Yeah, great question. And I would say that it's really both. That, um, that the way that we think about this is that, um, so, so we have, we're creating a suite of programs and related clinics and practicums and webinars that are oriented both around developing ourselves since um, um, as I've intimated at least, that regardless of what it is we do, that it ultimately starts with ourselves, that, that mm -hmm. any kind of work we do that, that, that engages you know, other people in develop, developing themselves in the way that we're talking about it here requires that we be ongoingly developing ourselves. It, it, the, two are, you know, the two are inseparable uh, in, in my view. And so, and yet, at the same time, there are particular skills and certain practices and models and frameworks. Yes, in the epistemological domain, that when we learn, we expand ourselves horizontally in our capacity to grow other people, um, all the while continuing to develop ourselves vertically. So we, could, we would say that, our, that the suite of programs we're creating are designed to operate across both of those uh, dimensions. Is that useful? You want to ask? Yeah. By the way, yeah. really, really good to see you. It's been really yeah, good to see you too. Good, good, good to hear you speak. Yeah. It's always inspiring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, great. Thank you. It's great to see you. You're inspiring too. All right. What else is here? Well, I, I have a, I have, I have a question for you. First mm -hmm. of all, I apologize again for dropping a little <laughs> f button. My, Michael, Michael probably saw that that I had I had surgery on major surgery on my knee a week ago, and I've been laying in bed for a week, as yeah. you can see. Yeah. And it just finding it brings out certain things in me that, yeah. <laughs> if you want to get annoyed, you get annoyed quickly. Lay in bed for a week. Um, how would how will you know? when it's working 
Which when what's working? What what you're embarking on now? Um. Um. Yeah. So. I would say that there would be a number of things. And so thank you for that question. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a great, really, really, really useful question for I think all of us here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> that the community continues to grow and that people in the community are engaged in um, making impact in the world. Um, so there's evidence of impact being made in the world uh, by people who encounter this work. Um, that and by impact, it doesn't necessarily have to be some sort of grand impact. It could be, you know, like people um, having um, fulfilling relationships with their families, for instance, you know. So, um, but also um, the number of people who come into the community um, would be also, these are all signals. You know, we don't really know, we can't possibly know if something is working necessarily, but we can, there are certain signals we could pay attention to. And then the nature of this work is, um, is subtle. Mm. And it's, um, and it's slow. And it's, um, It's profound at the same time. Yeah. But, the, but, but your question, I think, Jeff, really points to something that, that I've been cognizant of. And it's partly why I created this advanced program called um, Manifesting Your Calling. Um, because what I don't want this to turn into is a kind of a navel gazing society, you know, where we mm. just where we develop ourselves purely for the sake of, of developing ourselves that, and, and, and I think the way that we, the way that we do this work, it's always oriented around how we show up in the world, how we mm. show up for other people and the nature of the impact we're able to have on other people. Like that's a really big part of, 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 of this work. I'm of course really interested interested in where that what what underlie what underlies that question. Well, you, you know, Michael, you said, and I can't sorry, I can't reproduce the sentence you said, you know, but you you referred to the current, you know, the current iteration of humanity on Earth, and us maybe blowing it, right? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I can't I can't reproduce your exact your exact words. Um, but, you know, doing that really calls for playing a pretty huge game, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's one thing because, because, you know, Michael, you've known me for a long time. You know, we've been engaged in this particular practice. And I've kind of felt like we aren't setting, we aren't setting our game big enough, uh -huh. right? that we're okay with feeling that there's, you know, we do some subjective evaluation of enterprise agility or whatever, and that we're winning the game when no, that just means the game is just starting. And yeah. the, yeah. the big yeah. game, the bigger games that humanity needs to win soon, yeah. right? Yeah. That's where we really need to be called to be right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so, so that's kind of like, cause this is, this is really, really important work you're doing I, you know I kind of like right when I read read it I was like wow this is this is um this is something that that's been yearned for for a while and I, I but, but but you know I'm kind of and whenever I do this I kind of like what's the game I'm trying to win right so you know so this this deserves like another conversation and I welcome you into the community you and I should get on the phone or you and I and uh, Antoinette should get on the phone and have a conversation about this because this is something that you know is is definitely alive for me. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Good. I'm happy to hear you say that. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> that it's alive. Good. Thanks. And thank you. Thank you for doing this today. Mm -hmm.
my pleasure. And for not kicking me off the call. <laughs> Good. So we have time maybe for one, one other person to come in. And maybe, Will, we haven't heard from you at all. Um, uh, do you have anything you'd like to bring in, a question or a comment? Or... Yeah, so maybe a follow-up from, from Jeff's side and maybe just a little bit of context. Um, I feel like I've tried my hand at this work personally and in support of others since childhood and I'm not kidding if I say that. And it's bloody hard because learning the tools and journeying it alone is really quite challenging. Yeah. Um, so I've had this the secret hope and the silent prayer um, to to find like-minded people because very few people actually want to do the work and stick with it authentically. Yeah. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to to do it yourself if you can't actually practice and see it measured back. So that's the context. And the question is, um, bringing the transcendent promise to the imminent has a cost. We know this because modernity made it very clear. Um, everything that we went through from, from Greek times right through to now, everything history says that if you're doing this work, there's a cost to that. And I think the difficult question that I'm sitting in is what is the cost to the community that we anticipate it? that needs to be paid for us to do this work? Um, I'm having a hard time understanding the question. And I, by the way, I, I really admire and respect the way you set the stage for the question. So I feel a little embarrassed to say that I don't quite understand the question. So can you just say it again? And partly there's something in the audio that um, the, some of the words get, were getting a little garbled for me. So I was having a hard time following all of that. Um, so the apology is mine. I'm probably not expressing it properly. Um, so if you're doing this work, we know anything related to enlightened work, anything related to change work has a cost. Uh -huh. Energetically, if we're doing this work as a collective, there is a demand on the collective that is probably wise for us to be cognizant of. So if we are taking on this work, my question is, it's a difficult question. It's probably not something that, that can be answered today, but in line with what Jeff said is, what is the cost that you're anticipating this community to have to pay in order to do this work? You mean the cost and the, like the personal cost, like, like what, what you were referring to just a moment ago? Yeah, personal cost as well as as a collective. Um, so we know that from a system perspective, I'm a system, but together we are a different system, right? And as, as a system, it means that collectively there's there's a cost that, that we're going to have to pay relationally or um, personally, or there's, there, there are things that we're going to have to shift and, and face in order to do this work, um, whether it is resistance in organizations or elsewhere, a, a standard we need to take. Um, modernity paid its price. It, it led to World War II and everything else. Um, several other movements have paid their price. I, I think it's it's a question I'm sitting in because mm -hmm. this is important work, and there's always a cost to pay. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a complex, uh, it's a very complex question, and um, so obviously whatever it is I would respond would have to meet that complexity at, at least. And um, I think what I would say is that. Um, you know, so dialectic, dialectically, you know, there's always going to be, you know, the, or there's always going to be the shadow part of anything, right? Yeah. And so this kind of work inevitably will create its own shadows and does create its own shadows. You know, when you do, when you do deep spiritual work, you know, you have to do the shadow work along with it. And um, so I guess my hope is that, you know, that part of the work that we do includes doing the shadow work that needs to be done and to recognize, you know, always of course, that there will be breakdowns and, you know, breakdowns is just part of the unfolding of anything. And then finally, what I would wanna say is that, um, you know, it, again, if we had more time, I would want to examine the underlying mm. assumption mm. Of, of, of the way you framed the question, which is that, you know, getting to enlightenment or, uh, you know, or maybe uh, inner development or whatever, you know, however we, we call it, is hard. 
And um, I, I would want to push back on that a little bit and to discover right. the nature of that, that assumption um, because um, I, I would uh, suggest that that might be something you've made up uh, and you may have good reason for it. I'm not denying you that. I don't want to deny you that. I just want to just call attention to that. There may be an assumption there um, that may or may not be actually real. Very happy, very happy with that um, solution. I'm definitely going to take the, that away and think about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. cool. Okay, with that, um, we have I, to go. Yeah, I, I, I do need to go. Yeah, yeah it's five forty-seven here in uh, Stockholm, and Friday evening, and my wife and I've been who I've been ignoring all week, uh, <laughs> calling me. Yeah, so thank you, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Okay. Thank you for having us. Bye bye. See you. Bye, Jonas. See you.